Warning! This podcast contains themes of extreme violence and murder. Subject matter may be offensive to some listeners. Discretion advised. Welcome to another episode of Evil Transgression, your homicide headquarters here in podcasting. I'm Josh, and with me as always, Just Rex. Hey, what's up? And once again, Dustinless. Failure. Um, so Dustin had a jujitsu tournament today mm-hmm. for his uh, daughter, who right. is a certified badass. Yes. But... We would like for everybody to come up with all the wrong reasons why <laughs> Dustin really isn't here. Yeah. For example, he may have been arrested for uh, touching school children. <laughs> oh, God. <laughs> oh, man. Or uh, explosive diarrhea. I, I could definitely see that one. But before we get uh, too far into the episode, I want to dedicate this episode to one of our original listeners, our our OG of the evil mob. OG? Who was uh, a very important person in my life. Mm -hmm. My grandmother, who just passed yesterday. So, uh, it was a big blow to the family. Yeah. And... uh, but I, she was a, a day one listener to us mm-hmm. who supported us and was at times critical of us, but <laughs> nonetheless, loved the show, listened every week. Um, she will be missed. Oh, yeah. Um, but this episode goes out to you, Grams. Mm-hmm. Yep. We also um, want to give a shout out to somebody we've been speaking with uh, through Messenger quite often. Um, Brittany McDonald, mm-hmm. uh, give her a shout out. Longtime listener as well. Um, but uh, so those are our shout outs for the mm-hmm. for the episode here. Yep. Uh, what's uh, so, so? I think we should address what happened. What happened last week? Why <sighs> we didn't get an opportunity to put out a new episode last week? We gave you guys a, a Patreon only episode, mm-hmm. which we have on our uh, Patreon. Right. So if you are a subscriber to that, those are the type of episodes you get. Plus, you get all of our Beyond Evils. Um, But go ahead and address, Rex, what it was that happened (laughs) to our brand new studio uh, Uh, so that we could not record last week. So it it started, it was last Saturday. We normally record in the morning. And... uh, I've got a dehumidifier because, you know, that time of year, it's gets wet in the basement. So I go down to empty the bucket, and I'm in the bathroom down here, and my feet are getting wet. And I'm like, what the hell is going on? Never a good sign unless you have pissed on your feet. <laughs> right. So I, I see it coming from under the wall. So on the other side of that wall is the furnace and the water heater. And I go in there, and it's like a lake. Mm. I thought the water heater uh, had a hole in it. Um as I started investigating, there's a pipe that goes into the the concrete, and there was water coming up from that. Thankfully, that's where it was coming from and not where the sump pump is, because the sump pump is close to all this recording equipment. But, uh, you know, this is like 7 o'clock in the morning. I wake up Stacy. We go grab our 14-gallon shot vac, and uh, in the meantime, called Roto-Rooter to, to help fix the sump pump, because I'm like, we can't, we can't go hunt down our own. Because we got to get this water sucked up before it gets mm. worse. Um, I'm not exaggerating when I say we probably sucked up over 200 gallons of water because mm. it just kept shooting up. We would we'd fill up the shot vac, take it to the bathroom, dump it in the toilet, turn around, do it again, and that went on from seven until probably 12:30 when the guy finally got back and was able to uh, to get it all fixed. 
and uh, then it got better because he turned it on and right outside the house where the the pipe comes down to the ground and then goes horizontal underground Mm -hmm. that pipe had separated right there so what was happening is the water was going right back into the ground and the, the sump pump was just running all the time. Right. It was so, just recycling that same yep, water. Yep. So, yeah. Good so, times. So we had a natural disaster in the studio last week. Yeah. I mean, and luckily, I caught since I caught it so early, it didn't actually get into the studio. It was mainly the furnace area, the bathroom, um, and then a, a storage area. It did damage the bottom of the door frames a little bit, but thankfully, that's all it was. It could have been a lot worse. Exactly. So. But uh, we survived. Yes. The studio survived. You know, we got a little couple edges of the carpet were wet. Mm-hmm. Thankfully, like you said, our equipment was not injured. Right. And we were able to pick back up. That's right. So we didn't just blow everybody off. It wasn't like, hey, we ain't recording this week because we feel lazy. Yeah, right. I mean, we, we were up getting ready to leave when, at least I was. Dustin probably wasn't. He was still Dustin's sleeping. Dustin's always late. Yes, he is. But I was up getting ready to leave and get the phone call like, hey, uh, we got a problem. Mm-hmm. I was like, oh, no. I, I tell you what, though. That's just our luck with this house. Uh, to have just finished the basement six months ago and uh, have that happen. But again, all in all, you know, it wasn't bad. So in the midst of the chaos we've had for the last, you know, couple weekends, yes, uh, we really didn't get a chance to tell the female listeners of this show Happy Mother's Day. Oh yes, Happy Mother's Day. Whether you have the children yet or not, to us, you are still a mother. You probably have a dog or an animal. Mm-hmm. You're a mother to somebody, or yes, you're, you know, you're a mother in someone's eyes, right? Dustin is a mother effer, so <laughs> we wish him a happy Mother's Day as well. But yes. so let I say we basically make this episode about about the ladies. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And uh by doing that, we should just go ahead and start with some evil facts that are based and targeted exactly to the ladies, to All the right. women. Yeah. So let's give them some evil facts. Evil facts. Uh, females' most common method of killing is poison, as we all would know. Right, Dustin yep. loves when we cover a female serial killer uh-huh. because he always thinks that they're all poison. Oh, it's, yeah. Oh, here yeah. we go. Another mm-hmm. poison one. Every time. Um, another fact, they usually kill people that they have close relationships with, like their husbands, children, or elderly relatives. Mm. You know, meanwhile... On the opposite end, the male serial killers are more likely to target strangers. Yeah. So that's another difference. Um, women are less likely to have a prior criminal history than men when they commit their crimes. Hmm. On average, a female will take way longer to get caught. A 2011 study found that because of their more subtle techniques and general lack of criminal history... Women tend to get away with their sprees for longer than their male counterparts. Hmm. On average, a female serial killer's career spans 8 to 11 years, whereas men last an average of two. Wow. Another instance of men not lasting long enough. (laughs) Yes. Uh, Females are often motivated by material gain. In 2014, a study at Penn State Harrisburg uh, found that financial gain was the most common motive Mm -hmm. for female serial killers, whereas male serial killers are generally motivated by sex. Mm. They they also view women as being incapable of violent crime, but that is a mistake. Mm. They're less likely to torture their victims. This is uh, often viewed as, you know, their drive to kill for money or material gain. Uh They're they're doing what's necessary to get what they want. So they're less inclined to basically draw out the victim's suffering, which, again, is a stark contrast to how male serial killers whose motives are often sexual and sadistic in nature work. Mm Mm-hmm. So that 
is your female evil facts for the day. Good stuff. And we are going to cover a female today who uh, did some some pretty crazy things. Oh, yeah. Um, she is. Uh, she's. A, she's. A, she's. This is. A, this is an odd case. Uh huh. But we'll tie it into before we're done. The very first episode we ever did, and I'll, I'll show you mm. how we'll do that. Okay. Um, it might be a little bit of a reach, but I like to reach. Yeah. Not around, but. <laughs> uh, so I say we uh, we we get started. Yeah. And discuss Mary Jane Fonder. So buckle up, evil mob. As we head down this road together. Mary Jane Fonder was born on July 5th, 1942, in Philadelphia, Pennsylvania, to Mother Alice and Father Edward Fonder III. Mary Jane had a brother, Edward Fonder IV. So they were, like, not very creative with the (sighs) the male names in the family. The family lived in West Philadelphia, and I can't help but to think West Philadelphia, born and raised on a playground, is where I spent most of my days. <laughs> that's right, Fresh Prince. Sorry, that's back when Will Smith was, you know, cool. still loved by everyone. Right, yeah, now he's hated. Mary Jane's father was a machinist, and her mother was a proofreader. Mary Jane's childhood was a depressing one as she struggled emotionally throughout. It's not good when, as a toddler and child Mm -hmm. you're depressed because you struggle emotionally yeah when she was eight years old her family bought a home in springfield township in bucks county pennsylvania there she attended john bartram high school but her time in school was a rough one because she still struggled with emotional issues which caused her to in turn struggle in school She was institutionalized for a month during this time after she attempted to commit suicide by overdosing on a sedative. Wow, wow. That's not, that's not good either. No. I mean, she's already taken attempts on her life. Mm -hmm. At a, such a young age. Shortly after that episode, Mary Jane Fonda dropped out of high school and became an even more distant person. After dropping out of high school, Mary Jane Fonder hopped around from job to job working in a ceramic studio, a department store, various knitting factories, and at the J.P. Lippincott Publishing Company where she was a punch card operator. Hmm. Now, that's a job from the past. Yes. Uh, a punch card operator. Uh-huh. Nowadays, we pretty much call it data entry. <laughs> yeah. But punch card operator sounds so much cooler. It does. Fonda remained a single woman until her late 30s, but she never really had any serious relationships even after that. In 1987, the 45-year-old Mary Jane Fonda moved back to Springfield Township to take care of her aging parents. In 1992, Fonda's mother had a leg amputated due to health problems, and she had complications that put her in a coma for four months before she eventually passed due to the complications. Mm. That left Mary Jane and her father, Edward Fonder III, living alone in the family home. Edward began experiencing severe depression after the passing of his wife. He was often in a foul mood and began fighting with Mary Jane over the most trivial things. Mm. Their relationship took a severe downturn when two of Edward's elderly cousins visited the family home and harshly criticized Mary Jane. What did they criticize her for, you ask? The way she ate chicken. What? Yes. That's right. A father and daughter relationship was destroyed over the way Mary Jane Fonder got down on the foul. That is crazy. My girl, you eat chicken all weird. <laughs> you got any pet peeves on how uh, someone eats that drives you nuts? Like, have you ever been around somebody that eats a certain way and you're like... I just want to punch you in the face. I honestly, I don't think so. I I never, just doesn't even cross my mind. I'm like, you know, eat how you want to eat. Like, I've been around people that like smack when they. Oh, well, I guess that's a little annoying. When they chew. But but I've never harshly criticized them for it. Like, I I don't know. Maybe I have. I might be a a dirty (laughs) son of a bitch and lying, but 
Uh, yeah, so so that's what these elderly cousins, the way she's eating chicken, like, uh-huh. girl, you need to, you need to chew with your mouth closed or something. <laughs> <laughs> you know? uh-huh. So, but keep in mind, it's not Edward that's getting on her about the way she's eating her chicken. Uh-huh. It's it's his two cousins. You also have to keep in mind as well that Mary Jane Fonda has emotional issues that have been noted as far back as her childhood. True. So this was probably very detrimental in her mental well-being. Mm-hmm. I know it sounds bizarre, but it's true. Yeah. Maybe the the way you eat chicken is going to send her over the edge. <laughs> Maybe. On August 26th, 1993, 80-year-old Edward Fonda III disappeared from the Springfield Township home. Hmm. Mary Jane Fonda claimed she had heard the front door open while she was lying in bed that morning and thought her father was stepping outside to get the newspaper. She claimed she fell back asleep and when she woke around 11 a.m., discovered her father was still missing and the door was open. Hmm. Again, this is what she claimed. Yeah. Mary Jane contacted the police who searched for her father with assistance of the neighbors who lived nearby. Now, the 80-year-old Edward Fonda III could barely walk. He relied on his cane after undergoing two hip replacements, and he also needed daily doses of heart medication. Oh, wow. On the first morning, neighbors searched all 12 acres of the property along with the police, but they didn't find anything. A few days later, a search party of about 40 volunteers met on the property and searched through the woods shoulder to shoulder. Again, they came up with nothing. Police would ramp up their search, sweeping the property with bloodhounds and even a helicopter. Again, nothing was found. Mm. Eight months after his disappearance, Edward Fonder III's wallet was found in a mailbox in Allentown, Pennsylvania. All of its contents were still there. So that's that's a weird, yeah, weird that's thing. That's really like, weird. His wallet with everything in it shows Just up. Just suddenly shows up in a mailbox. In Allentown. Yeah. yeah. Authorities never believed Mary Jane Fonder's claims that her father had just wandered off. Mm-hmm. This was in part to the fact that the old man couldn't move that well and would not leave without his medication that he needed daily. Mm-hmm. Mary Jane Fonder was the prime suspect in the disappearance, but no evidence of foul play could be found. During one interview in the Fonder's home, an investigator noticed a bucket filled with pinkish water along with towels, a mop, and a chicken. Mm. We all know how Mary Jane and the chicken get down, right? (laughs) Yeah. They also found the corpse of a dog wrapped in plastic inside the freezer. What? I mean, that's odd, and it sends up red flags. Uh, Yeah. But it doesn't prove that she killed her father, right? That's just really weird, though. I mean, but it would make you think, like, hey, maybe she's capable of killing her uh, old man. Yeah, yeah she's got so. She's got a dead dog in the freezer. <laughs> yeah. I've never been in any, well, at least that I know of, <laughs> yeah. anyone's house that has dead dogs yeah. in their freezer. That's crazy. Although Mary Jane Fonda cooperated with authorities, things changed after the investigators tried to get a confession from her. In February of 1994, roughly six months after her father's disappearance, she banned police from her property hired a lawyer, and voiced her displeasure with the police tactics used against her. Mm, Interesting. Yeah, that's not odd either. (laughs) Yeah. You got dead dogs in your freezer, Uh, and now you're like, police, you need to get out of my house. Yeah, banning the police. Edward Fonda III was legally declared dead in 2000, which is a state law in Pennsylvania when someone is missing for more than seven years. Mm, I didn't know that. Things remained quiet for Mary Jane Fonder for years until early 2008. Mary Jane was a member of the Trinity Evangelical Lutheran Church in Springfield Township. Mm, really? It was said that she really liked the attention she got from the pastor and the congregation being the lonely Mary Jane Fonder. Mm. But when another woman started attending the church and got the attention that Mary Jane Fonder craved... Things got vicious. Uh oh. On January 23rd, 2008, 42 year old Rhonda Smith was shot and killed as she did volunteer work in the office of the Trinity Evangelical Lutheran Church. Mm. 
Smith was shot twice in the head and died at the hospital after being taken off of life support. Wow. Mary Jane Fonder's behavior during this time was very odd, to say the least. She sent sympathy cards to the family of Rhonda Smith, baked them pies, and even sat by the family during the funeral. Mm. In one of the sympathy cards, she even wrote that it should have been her in the ground and not Rhonda because anyone could have been in the office that day at church. What? The 65-year-old Mary Jane Fonder became a prime suspect early on in the investigation when the church's pastor told authorities that Mary Jane Fonder had shown some odd behavior since being involved in the church. The pastor claimed that Mary Jane would leave long-winded voicemails for him and would leave food for him in his kitchen without consent or knowledge. Mm. She would come into his house... That is weird. And leave food for him. That's so weird. So she had kind of a thing for the pastor. Uh, yeah. I, I kind of thought that when you first started talking about it. Yeah. And then, but I mean, going back to writing the, the sympathy cards and sitting uh-huh. with the family, that to me, that shows somebody again that just wants to be in the spotlight. Oh, yeah. Wants to be seen. Yeah. Like somebody craving attention. Mm-hmm. Yep. Police began to focus more on Fonder when they discovered she had called the church on the day of the murder and found out that Smith would be alone in the church's office that day. Fonder, who quite frequently wore a wig, kept an appointment at a hair salon on the same day to have her natural hair washed and styled after shooting Smith and actually left her wig at the salon where police later retrieved it. Kind of like an alibi. So she could say she couldn't have killed Smith because oh, yeah. she was she getting was her there. hair did. Right. Even though she frequently wore a wig. <laughs> a few months after the murder, fishermen found a 38 caliber revolver on the shore of Lake Nakamixon. That matched the murder weapon. Mm. It was registered to none other than Mary Jane Fonder. So it was actually registered to her, and that's what she used? Yeah. Genius. She was arrested on April 1st, 2008. During questioning, Mary Jane Fonder admitted to having purchased and registering a 38 caliber revolver, but claimed that she had thrown it into the lake in 1994, which was several years before Rhonda Smith's murder. Wow. She gave the investigators two conflicting reasons why she had thrown it in the lake, but neither one of them really panned out. Uh Uh-huh. But forensics never lie and testing done on the firearm and ammo found that it had been placed in the lake more recently, making Mary Jane Fonder a liar. Mm -hmm. This also opened Mary Jane Fonder's father's disappearance case. Nice. On October 21st, 2008, Fonder's trial began. Prosecutors argued that Mary Jane Fonder, who was a member of the church for 14 years, was jealous of the attention that Rhonda Smith received from the pastor and the members of the church. Defense attorneys for Fonder claimed that she was not present during the murder and that the death might have been suicide or a homicide committed by a jealous wife or lover. Mm. I'm sorry, but shooting oneself in the head twice yeah. is not suicide. No. The latter is possible, but a a double banger to the brain isn't a common method of suicide. Uh, Well, especially when there was no gun around. Yeah, exactly. But (laughs) two shots to the head, like, (laughs) she committed suicide. She shot herself twice in the head. (laughs) Right. What an idiot. Fonder's attorney, during closing arguments, even pointed the finger at her own brother, Edward Fonder IV, after he had hired a lawyer, after finding what he thought was bullet fragments in his car and notified police. The fragments, however, were not connected to the crime. On October 30th, 2008, a jury found Mary Jane Fonder guilty of first-degree murder and possession of an instrument of crime. She was sentenced to life in prison on December 5th, 2008. At her sentencing, she made the following statement. I did not kill Rhonda Smith. I thought she was a lovely girl, and I certainly wasn't jealous of this woman for any reason. I'm so sorry she's gone, but in the same respect, I will be gone too. I'm the second person in the church to be murdered by the system. What? 
Exactly. <laughs> I'm the second person. She is crazy. Yeah. This system just murdered uh, yeah. Rhonda Smith. Just shot her in the head twice. The system did it. What? Founder originally appealed her conviction, but dropped her appeal in February of 2010. On June 4th, 2018, Mary Jane Fonder died of cardiac arrest at the State Correctional Institution in Lycoming County, Pennsylvania. Mm. The Fonder property was eventually sold to a neighbor who has allowed investigators back onto the property to search for any evidence in what happened to Edward Fonder III. Nice. To this day, they have yet to find anything. So this reminds me a lot of our very first episode, like uh, I said, yeah. of Evil Transgression, where we discussed the murderous Antoinette Frank, whose father also came up missing. Mm-hmm. But in that case, if you remember, they found remains under the home. Right. Even though, as far as I know, they never concluded they were her father's. If you remember, they never mm-hmm. yeah. they never uh, pinned it down to being her father's remains. So if you haven't heard that episode, make sure you check it out. It's it's titled Killer Cop. Oh, yeah. And uh, we yeah. definitely sounded a little yeah. bit different. It's a there bit cringeworthy <laughs> yeah. as we were newbies to the podcast yeah. game. But nonetheless, it is it is a good one. True. But uh, the Mary Jane Fonder, man. I mean, what do you think? You think she killed her old oh, man? Oh, for sure. And she probably dumped him in the lake. It might be, yeah, he might be in the lake beside yeah. the gun. Like Right. Strange, strange mm-hmm. situation. Um, but it's just a really pointless murder. Yeah. I mean, if it's about the attention, it's just odd. Like, yeah. And, and we discussed in the evil facts that, you know, that female killers usually have a different motive than yep. male killers. So, I mean, maybe that is what happened, but. Yeah, jealousy. Jealousy took her right down the path to uh, no-no land. Yep. And her dropping her appeal in 2010 is kind of odd to me, too. If you're saying, no, I didn't do it, uh, you know, the the system's going to murder me. Yep. Why drop your appeal? Exactly. Maybe she finally came to terms with who she was and what she'd done. Maybe. She was definitely guilty. So that is your episode today. So suck it, Dustin. That yeah, was a Dustin, female killer. That was a female killer that didn't poison. Yeah, see, you were wrong, Dustin. Stupid Dustin. He is so stupid. This is the Dustin. Freaking hate him. This is the part of the episode where we're going to bash <laughs> Dustin. Yeah. A little ginger. A little stupid ginger. <laughs> that was good. So what do you got for me, Rex? All right, go to our Facebook page. Give us a like. Any comments, questions, ideas, you can email us at eviltransgression at gmail.com. Make sure you go to eviltransgressions.com. Check out all of our links. Our link to our Patreon, yes. if you would like to join that. Uh, the tip jar, yes, which we enjoy tip jars when we have mm. to uh, you know, pay to fix up Rex's door frames uh, and uh, yeah. Uh, yeah. stuff around the studio. Yeah, because let me tell you, that sump pump, so we went hardcore. I mean, this one now has a, uh, the primary pump. There's yeah. a secondary pump in case that fails, and it's on battery backup. Nice. Because I'm like, this shit's not going to happen again. There you so. go. So definitely check out all of our links. Get you some evil transgression gear, your evil mob shirts. There's a sweet two-sided shirt on our on our merch site. Yes. Um, get your Get your gear. Send us a picture of you and your gear. We'll put you up on the faces of the evil mob on eviltransgression.com. Definitely. So you can get you can tell all your friends that you're on a website mm-hmm. and uh, all that good stuff. Drop us a line. Send us some comments. Uh, follow us on Facebook. Follow us on Twitter. Yes. Um. Instagram. Yep. We have Instagram too. Mm-hmm. So, with that being said, I think we're we're at that at that yep, time. I think we are. So, that one was for you, Graham. Yes. R I P. R I P. Ah. Mm-hmm. All right, Evil Mob. Until next time. See ya. See ya. <laughs> Peace. <laughs>